Um, hello everyone, and thank you for coming uh, to our slot today with uh, CARM. My name is Christos. We will talk about uh, our joint work with Red Hat uh, in the Aero project. I am, uh, have, as you see, a couple of jobs. Uh, the main one for this talk is that I'm coordinating uh, technically the Aero project. So, and CARM with me. Hello, I'm CARM. I work as a quality engineer at Red Hat on making Quarkus compilable to native image. Over to you. Uh, thank you. So let's start a little bit. So this, in this presentation, we're going to start talking about European policy and going to go down to compilers. So it's going to be a, a, a rough ride, but st stay with us. So what is what is all about? Um, the whole story about how the European Commission uh, sees the sovereignty of the European Union regarding chip manufacturing started, I would say, more or less along with the pandemic and uh, the fact that the majority of the chip manufacturing in the world is concentrated in uh, Taiwan. To solve these problems, uh, both the US and the EU, they uh, put forward legislation in order to, uh, to create sovereignty. So what it means? To the European Commission, in particular, they voted the European Chips Act, which is a 50 billion euro budget project um, in order for the, for the Union to be able to design, uh, manufacture, fabricate, and procure um, processors within, uh, made in the EU, let's say, uh, which is a big task. It's a big task and it requires a lot of uh, investment, both from individual countries and also from the Commission. In order, after this was voted, which was, let's say, a couple of months ago. Um, in parallel, the European Union was already starting the prep work. So what it means, uh, projects in order to build both the hardware and the software. And as part of this collection of different hardware and software, it is our project, which is called the Aero. So the goal of the Aero is to create um, optimize the software stack of a typical cloud application stack like the Docker Kubernetes, different runtimes and uh, operating systems uh, in order to be ready when the hardware of this EU processors will go into market. So essentially imagine that there are projects building the hardware and the software working in parallel and at some point in the, in, in the near future hopefully we're going to be able to um, use these projects or at least the outcome of these projects in order to run and help companies within the EU to migrate from Amazon or Azure to these cloud services. And in particular, in this Aero project, we are many partners and the idea is that we're trying to get a collection of uh, software frameworks that exist on uh, current cloud deployments and optimize them. And this hardware ecosystem it's going to be very heterogeneous. It's going to be cores with accelerators inside in the SOCs and uh, accelerators like GPUs and FPGAs connected uh, around these uh, cloud services. And we try to optimize um, compilers and runtimes and different frameworks for managing uh, cloud operations. And of course, it's a small project. We cannot solve all the software, but it's a good start to have a first um, um, uh, implementation that makes sense for somebody to use these EU cloud services. So, what is this hardware? We don't know. I mean, we know, but not exactly. So, what, what is the, so what we don't know? We know that the, there are many projects of creating different designs. So, there are projects under the umbrella, which is called the European Processor Initiative, which creates different designs. Of course, of accelerators, of interconnections, packagings, and these designs, they are being funneled to other projects like ours, where we take those test beds and we start bringing up the software. So if you go to the European Processor Initiative website, you're gonna see many different streams, uh, chips for uh, HPC, chips for automotive, for IoT, some of them are ARM-based, some of them are RISC-V based, so it depends the project, they experiment with different designs. But nevertheless, no matter which design somebody will choose, at some point we will have to um, run and prove its performance. We are not involved in the hardware design. We are, let's say, the consumers of these hardware designs where we bring the software. So our target, it is a hybrid of ARM and RISC-V, which is the first commercially available processor 
from the EPI project, which is from a French company called Cyperl, which is their processor, which is an, an ARM core. Inside, they put some RISC-V accelerators, and then you have PCI Express connected GPUs from Intel and NVIDIA. And of course, we have other, let's say, FPGAs uh, to experiment with more, let's say, research stuff compared to current uh, upstream um, um, software. I cannot talk about, I don't have time at least to talk about the whole software we target, so I'm, I'm trying to narrow down the discussion to manage programming models and runtimes, which is uh, University of Manchester and uh, Red Hat's, let's say, expertise. Um, as you see, here is the whole stack that we try to, to cover. And um, regarding the runtimes, we target um, Manas programming language, like the JVM. So although my talk is called Java, in reality, it's JVM. So anything that runs on top of the JVM will benefit from this work. And um, we target uh, Java and uh, uh, frameworks for microservices and uh, Tornado VM for accelerating Java or the JVM applications on GPUs and FPGAs. And of course, we have the other stream for native programming languages like SQL and DPC++ and One API, uh, which is done by Codeplay and Intel in this project. So now I'm going one layer down the abstraction and I will narrow down the discussion about the Java or the JVM. So what do we do in this project? Normally, we op try to optimize two main frameworks. Of course, we have the OpenJDK distributions uh, that they now have RISC-V backports uh, from Alibaba, and they already have ARM support, and Red Hat is doing a great uh, work supporting the ARM uh, builds. And um, these are all, let's say, more or less upstream, and the people can download and use them. And now we take it a step further, let's say in, at least in our project, to try to experiment with this hybrid ARM RISC-V and accelerators. So how this would look like for the developers and for the hardware. And we focus on Quarkus, which will be um, the part of um, the talk from CARM, and Tornado VM. The Tornado VM is a framework, probably you haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a framework um, from the University of Manchester, uh, where we're trying to, let's say, bring uh, higher performance through heterogeneous execution on the JVM. So what is Tornado VM? In, in a sentence, it is a JVM plugin. Although it's called VM, it's not a new VM. Tornado VM by itself doesn't run anything. It needs a host JVM. So it is a plugin. So you have, let's say, Amazon Coreto or Mandrel from Red Hat or OpenJDK. You download it, you plug in Tornado, and it gives you a lightweight, a lightweight API which you can use to accelerate automatically code on GPUs and FPGAs. And I will show you later a little bit uh, how. So essentially, it is an add-on on any virtual machine, JVM, that supports JVM CI, that we can use to um, accelerate automatically code on accelerators. And it has, let's say, two main features that we advertise. The first one is, of course, the API. So you don't have to do a lot of work. If you have done GPU programming currently, you have to use JNI calls and CUDA kernels and uh, do the, the memory management, uh, manually copying data from the Java heap to the actual accelerator. So Tornado VM solves all this problem. Tornado VM does not expose any hardware to the developer. So we, we are very strong believers of the original Java idea that you Right ones, and you run everywhere. And for us, this everywhere is not only multi GPU CPUs, but also GPUs and any platform or modern hardware platform that exists. And of course, we have the automatic cost specialization. Now, if we run, for example, um, OpenJDK on ARM or Intel, the compiler, the C2 or the Graal compiler, whatever we use, will have a specific compilation chain, and underneath we have the intrinsics, so each company goes and puts their own specialization. This is what Tornado VM does also. If you compile your code for GPUs, it's gonna be different. If you compile your code for Intel GPUs, it's gonna be different than NVIDIA. So we detect all those uh, hardware and automatically we specialize the code to uh, run better on its platform. So how do we do it? Essentially, we uh, plug into existing JVM, in that case OpenJDK, so developers can use our API, and then we take the, the, the byte codes we go through Grand Compiler, we do the IR, and then we lower either to uh, OpenCL, 
or PTX for CUDA, or SPRV for level zero. And each of those frameworks can target different kind of devices. And uh, on the top on the right, we have different kind of distributions we support and different kinds of hardware vendors we, uh, that we support. I cannot, again, I would like to spend at least six hours talking about Toronto VMs, but I cannot. So um, I will try to uh, give a small, let's say, um, idea of what is uh, the model we use. So in any GPU programming model, essentially we have to do two or three things, depending how we look at it. The first one is we have to copy the data from the CPU memory to the accelerator memory. We have to run the code there, the kernel, the CUDA or OpenSea, whatever, and then we have to copy the data back from the GPU's memory back to the Java heap. And this, let's say, execution model, it is really simple to comprehend. I have to do three things, no problem, but in the JVM world, these three things require a lot of code, a lot of code that you have to do manually. So we solve these problems by automating everything that the developer shouldn't care about. How? By having essentially um, two types of code at, in the API of Tornado. The first one it is the, the host code, the, the, the controller who does the playmaking, which data is gonna go where, how, and all these optimizations. And the second one is the compiler will generate the kernel or the code that corresponds to our, corresponds to our Java method for acceleration. And we have the task graph here with essentially the structure that we compose different tasks. So in that case, we have a, a, a method called method day in class, right? So this is like a lambda function. So we don't change the Java code, we just pass it there and um, the compiler will piggyback or some annotations we put, and then we'll compile it and run it a complete transparent to us. So there's no GNI or any, any manual uh, work that have to be done. Now, we have two APIs for development, what we call the loop parallel API and the kernel API. These are um, complementary. The loop parallel API, it is more for, if you have a for loop, let's say you have a for loop that it's very heavy and I want to accelerate it, you just put an annotation and then we do it automatically. But if you're a power user, so if you come from CUDA and you want to put your barriers, your local memory, all those GPU uh, stuff inside, you can use the more advanced uh, kernel API. So I make so everything sounds perfect, right? Turn of VM is gonna solve our problems. Is it? No, why? Because we have to know when to use it. Not all applications require the raw power of, of, a, of a GPU. Only some of them, they require it. For example, some use cases we have are computer vision, uh, ray tracing, and machine learning, and phase detection. As soon as we have a lot of compute, a lot of parallel comp uh, computation and data to process, then I think it, it makes sense to consider uh, GPU acceleration. And uh, Toronto VM is, uh, in our opinion, the, one of the easiest way uh, to achieve that. So I would like to conclude now by hopefully showing the ray tracing uh, uh, demo running. Um, we just ported it from Linux to um, ARM MacBook, so I cannot guarantee that it will run. Okay, so what do we have here? This is, this is a scene written full in Java. There is no C code here, okay? This is full in Java that does ray tracing. So it renders in real time on the CPU, on a single thread, at one, two FPS, okay? So if I go here and I try to zoom, it's very choppy because now the, the CPU now is struggling, now it's working uh, uh, full. And if I zoom now, you could see the shadows, the reflection of the light source on, on the rays on each ball. So this is not real time, this is useless. And you can ask me why you write this. So I'll show you in a second. So let's change implementation. Let's go from pure Java single threaded to another Java implementation that uses parallel streams. Now, I'm around 10 FPS because this is a 10 core uh, machine. I can scale out uh, on the machine. And now it's easier for me to zoom in. Before I was zooming in, but you couldn't see because it was moving like a turtle. So let's now go GPU. So now, the four magics happened. The first magic, it didn't crash, okay. The second, <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, se the second magic, we see here, 
we now the the same Java code. This is the same Java code that was running in Consigli Freddy. Tornado VM took it, compiled it to OpenCL, and ran it on the M1 Pro GPU, which is a really powerful one uh, for the record. And now we are at 60 FPS. And now we can actually start. It's real time. You can zoom in, zoom out, and also you can change the different uh, shadows and reflection bounces. The more we change them, the more heavy uh, it becomes. So again, this is pure Java code, automatically compiled to open cell, running on the GPU. Third miracle. Third miracle is that now all the computation happens on the GPU, so the CPU is sitting idle. So let's develop a physics engine on the CPU. Run the rendering on the GPU, the physics engine on the CPU. So now all these physics engines here, you see all these balls that are bouncing. This all code is simply made on the CPU. The GPU does the rendering. The fourth magic that I didn't have to stop the application. I can change now the Java code between running on the CPU, running on the GPU, make combination while the application is running. And this is, I would say, the strength of Tornado VM, which is called dynamic configuration. And this is where the VM comes inside. Tornado VM internally has its own byte codes that can recompile the code for GPU or CPU the same way that the OpenJDK or any JVM compiles the code between C1 and C2 without stopping the code. So we follow the same ideas, but this time for heterogeneity. And I think my time is up. Thank you very much. And I pass the microphone to Carm to talk about the beautiful Quarkus. It is a fourth miracle whether <laughs> we managed to, <coughs> to switch the displays or whether my setup survives it. Wow. <laughs> Hello, one, one, one. Uh, I will be talking about Quarkus, which is a Java framework. Uh, it's a part of uh, the Arrow project, uh, and it's a suite of libraries that are tailored to be cloud native. And in our context, that means uh, being very small, um, also in the, in the footprint and in the resources consumption. Uh, I'll be dropping uh, some buzzwords. So uh, I don't know what's, uh, who's in the, in the audience. Like if I say hibernate, uh, does it ring any bells here? Okay, a couple of them, Spring, some Java libraries. Okay, so uh, this is Java on the server side, like building Java applications, mostly on the server side. Um, uh, GraalVM, it's a JDK, a custom JDK with custom JIT and capabilities to compile various languages in a native executable. Uh, Mandrel, uh, that's what uh, our team is focusing on. It's a distribution of GraalVM, which is uh, made uh, smaller because it focuses only on, on Java. It doesn't deal with uh, other languages. And its uh, main differentiator is that it uses Temurin JDK as its base, and it adds the native image tool to it. So while you are using Mandrel, you are using the Temurin JDK you would download from Adoptium without any uh, additional patches. Um, so native image is the tool we'll be uh, talking about today. Uh, it compiles the suite of your libraries in Quarkus in your application into a native executable. So you can have your Java application that uses several databases, has database drivers, it talks to uh, Elasticsearch, it got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of dependencies, and native image will uh, choose through all of that, uh, construct some kind of a close world uh, with all uh, your dependencies, and compile that into a native executable, including all uh, resources, all additional files, it's all going to be baked in a single executable. Uh, this closed world assumption is an important stone in this whole machine uh, because sometimes you need to specify that uh, uh, you are going to do at runtime something that is not apparent from, from your source code. But Quarkus helps you with that and does this heavy lifting for you. So for instance, if, an, if a library, let's say Elasticsearch, is doing something at runtime that it's not apparent at build time, uh, there is a Quarkus extension you depend on, and this Quarkus extension recognizes it, uh, 
uh, constructs bytecode for it, and then it's ready for the compilation. So you can uh, compile things in your native executable that wouldn't be surprised at runtime by a missing, uh, let's say, class. Uh, I will jump right into trying it out on an ARM server. Um, hopefully, we are now, we are now uh, connected to Ampere Ultra 80 core uh, ARM server. Uh, I got Jenkins running there. And we will uh, build Quarkus application. Uh, I got uh, downloaded JDK, uh, but not our native image, not, not the compiler, because that's uh, going to be used from a uh, container image. Uh, while it does its thing, I will continue this slide and then come back to it. Uh, Quarkus is a huge suite of uh, extensions. So while your end application is uh, trimmed to the bare minimum and uh, the footprint is as small as possible, the, the possibilities of all libraries are really huge. And many of them package some native uh, code in the jar files. And that comes pertinent to uh, making sure that things run on, on ARM. Uh, because not all of those libraries produce ARM binaries with them. Um, and there is some example of all the libraries that in the core Quarkus got some native dependencies. And there are some of them that don't currently produce uh, ARM uh, binaries. Uh, those are usually loaded uh, with uh, Java native interface and have some Java fallback. So currently Quarkus runs on ARM, but there is still a lot of stuff that could be done to make it, make it better. Uh, this compiler I talked about, the, uh, the Mandrel distribution of GraalVM can be downloaded from uh, our uh, GitHub uh, site, uh, where we got uh, ARM binaries for Linux. And we also uh, produce uh, uh, container images. So you don't have to install it on your system. You can just get the uh, Temurin JDK with the native image compiler uh, from the container. And that's what the Quarkus framework does for you also. So as a, as a Java developer, you can tell Quarkus, OK, I've got my application as a Java developer I'm used to. Compile it to native image for me. I don't know what's native image. I don't know what's LVM, and I kind of don't care, I want my application to be compiled to native executable, and Quarkus uh, uh, downloads that uh, container image, uses Docker or Podman, and uh, compiles it uh, for you. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, testing involved to make sure that uh, Quarkus uh, is gradually more and more uh, ready for, for ARM. Uh, we use uh, various integration test suites for that, some of those are uh, tiny uh, specialized apps or uh, reproducers targeted at some special uh, features. Some of them are uh, huge suites, or let's say Quarkus integration test suite. And some of them are kind of artificial applications that jam a lot of stuff on top of each other to really stress the compiler that it could handle a lot of generated entities on Hibernate or stuff like that, and that it wouldn't blow up and it would uh, handle it. Um, you can build Mandrel yourself, and it's not a joke. It's not any kind of like obscure one of those projects you cannot compile when you, when you download them. Uh, the compil compilation scripts are written in Java using JBank, and you can run it. You just give it uh, Java Home uh, to Temur in JDK, uh, GraalVM uh, GitHub repo, and it compiles the native image compiler for you, the distribution. Uh, we got public facing uh, Jenkins, uh, where we got these ARM servers connected, where we uh, build and test periodically on various branches. Uh, so that's our uh, public facing uh, driver. And these are our uh, precious uh, uh, loved ones, our two uh, bare metal servers we are currently most uh, working with. Uh, they are photographed on my desk, but right now they are safely in a data center. Uh, <laughs> David looks like he doesn't trust me, but it's really already gone. It's not there anymore on the desk. Uh, 
Uh, those were donated uh, by, by ARM to, uh, to make uh, this effort uh, accelerated, and it's part of the, of the Aero uh, effort we are doing. And they've got the same Neoverse N1 architecture as the current uh, Aero uh, spec or the target. Uh, they are quite beefy machines uh, with 80 cores. Um, uh, the compilation I started uh, uh, is done and the Quarkus is running, so I'll just scroll back to see what, uh, what took place. Um, I started, um, I, I downloaded uh, start with Quarkus uh, like demo project, uh, un unpacked it, and just run uh, Maven. That's uh, that's all that, that happened um, in in this uh, uh, Quarkus application, uh, and it compiled the uh, Java bits. It compiled Java bytecode, and then it realized that I'm trying to do a native uh, native image build, and that I don't have any native image or GraalVM uh, Mandrel compiler on this system on the path. Uh, so it resulted to check in whether I have Docker or Podman installed. It found I got Podman on the, on the server. So it used Podman to download a Mandrel uh, builder image, which is one of the artifacts we are regularly updating and uh, pushing to publicly accessible uh, container registry. Um, and it downloaded that image. It was, uh, it was already downloaded on the system. Uh, And the um, horrendous um, blob of text it was constructed automatically by, by Quarkus uh, for you to drive the compilation of your application to the native executable. So that was generated by, by Quarkus. Uh, it realized what your application needs to be properly uh, compiled to a native executable, and that process started. Um, the reason why I kind of sneakily uh, alt tapped elsewhere was that the compilation is by no means instantaneous. It takes some time. Um, it analyzes uh, the classes in the, in the closed world. It, it, re it analyzes whether there is any JNI access. Um, and it finally uh, got the the executable image with, with machine code that also contains uh, baked in resources. So for instance, if you've got, if you've got uh, some properties files in your jar files or something like that, that's all going to be packed in one single executable. Uh, and it took the 40 seconds to, uh, to build. And the Quarkus is running now and I can access the its default web page for this one particular demo application. Uh, the same binary, literally the same I built there, uh, can be run also on my phone. I don't know how to connect it to the uh, projector, but it runs there, it runs Deb Debian. Uh, and Quarkus starts there in 58, uh, 52 milliseconds. Uh, to assess the state of things and to gradually make them better, we are collecting uh, metrics about build time and the runtime. Build time is what I showed here, uh, how long it took uh, to compile the application. Uh, bigger the application, bigger your, your closed world, uh, the longer it, uh, it takes um, or could take. Uh, so that's one of the, the things we are looking at, and also the runtime. So that's uh, how the application behaves uh, when it runs. Uh, we've got a collector for that, a tool written uh, in Java using Quarkus. Reason why I mention that is that I don't have any Java installed on my server. I build the application in GitHub Actions, and I just uh, push the executable to the server, so there is a huge a rich Java application talking to database running on the server, but the server doesn't have any kind of JVM installed on it. Uh, uh, this is how we assess the build time uh, metrics, and uh, and this is an example of uh, some of them that are collected. The most important uh, would be uh, 
how long it took in all to uh, to compile an application an application uh, and also it's important what the target uh, architecture uh, runtime matrices uh, are more interesting uh, there is a rough comparison of the same application that uses a lot of uh, micro profile uh, libraries um, in hotspot it takes uh, much more memory to uh, uh, to run uh, and in, in native image it's much more memory efficient the the reason for that is that it doesn't have to keep a lot of metadata for a lot of stuff because there is no there is no just in time compilation there is no deoptimization it just fixed what's compiled in the binary so there is a lot of stuff that's not needed at the uh, at the runtime uh, and it also starts uh, quicker uh, that's not only uh, thanks to the uh, native compilation, but it's m also thanks to Quarkus that uh, pre-initializes a lot of stuff and bakes it on the on the heap. Uh, I ran through that really quickly, but we agreed to leave five minutes before the end for questions. So we can go back, both of us, uh, to anything that caught your eye or that you find weird or suspicious and you would like to heckle us about or ask about. So shoots now oh, dead silence the question the question was whether tornado vm is using only public gdk apis or whether there is anything to be proposed to the whole gdk ecosystem take the floor the, the answer is yes in both of the, of the questions so at the moment, we are using normal Java APIs, uh, but uh, so two things. First, we use normal Java APIs. The JVM has to be JVM CI compatible, so it has support the, in the, the interface. Uh, but the, the, as soon as we go to end of VM, as soon as we go to GPUs, the Java spec doesn't apply anymore because that's parallelism. As soon as you go to a parallel uh, computations, then you cannot uh, guarantee consistency or ordering uh, any. Uh, but as Tornado VM improves, we would like to, sub to propose to the, the committee uh, some changes that would help benefit Tornado VM, specifically for native data types and the Panama integration. Any questions? We've got one early quitter. <laughs> I would hear a hairpin drop in this room. <laughs> so they are, they are either like stunned yeah. how awesome it was, <laughs> or didn't understand, or I don't know. Okay, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.